A few weeks ago, LS Mark made a great video about South Park and the perception that the show is mean-spirited. I highly recommend checking that video out if you haven't yet, but while watching it, it made me realize just how many of my favorite South Park moments are actually incredibly heartfelt and wholesome. For a show that some consider mean-spirited, they sure do excel at tugging at the heartstrings when they want to. So I called up Mark and I said, hey, let's collab on this. And he said, sounds good, but he said that in an Irish accent. So here we are. Johnny and Mark break down all of our favorite heartfelt and most wholesome moments in South Park. Let's do it. But first, I want to talk about today's video sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is an awesome monthly membership club that ships you top shelf products from under the radar brands. And they have some truly cool and unique stuff, all based on your personality determined by a preference quiz, and they're constantly rotating new things every single month. Every box contains around $70 in retail value, but costs you only $49. And every month you'll be able to preview what's being sent to you before it ships out. If you don't like what they chose, you can swap it out for a different box or skip the month entirely at no charge. Check out what they sent me. First up, I got the Forge box, which contains this incredible knife. It's high quality, and I mean, look at it, it's beautiful. Plus, I've been able to use it to open each new box they send me every month, like the Dram box. Now, I'm a whiskey guy, and the Dram box has me covered. Perfect for old fashions, one of my favorite drinks. And lastly is the box I will definitely be using the most, the Weekender, a perfectly sized travel bag for quick getaways. I'm literally headed to Vegas this weekend, and all of my stuff is going straight into this thing. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter cellos20 at checkout or go to www.bespokepost.com slash cellos20. Check out Bespoke Post and order your first box today. South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut is probably best known for just that, being bigger, longer, and at the time, the film with the most uses of profanity in history. But despite its reputation, the film itself actually has not just one, but many incredibly wholesome moments. Ironically, they give an entire heartfelt I want song to Satan himself as he laments his place in the world and his desire to escape hell and simply live a freeing life on Earth. But nothing is sweeter than Kenny's role in this film, and his ultimate sacrifice at the end. Really, the entire story revolves around Kenny, as his death is the primary inciting incident in the film. Down in hell, Kenny actually shows support for Satan as he suffers through his abusive relationship, which eventually gives Satan the courage to push Saddam Hussein out of his life by killing him. But the heartfelt moment that tops all others in this film comes right after this, when Satan tells Kenny he'll grant him one wish, anything he wants, and Kenny wishes that everything could go back to the way it was before the war and the rising of hell onto Earth. Kenny offers to save his friends and the world, even if it means that he would have to go back to hell. And then, for the first time in the series, we get a real look at Kenny's face and hear his real voice. Bye, you guys. This moment gets me every time. Cash for Gold is one of the more underrated episodes from the series in my opinion. Not only does it feature a hilarious story about Cartman trying his new get-rich-quick scheme, inspired by shopping network channels trying to sell old people useless cheap jewelry, but it's also got what I believe to be one of the best moments in the series featuring Stan's grandpa. Here we see Stan concerned about his grandfather spending all his money on this stuff, with him slowly realizing that his bad memory is a lot more serious than previously let on. She doesn't like jewelry, Grandpa. She's, she's just a baby, after all. She's not a baby, Grandpa. She's 13. Shelly's 13? It's here where he tells Stan about a dog he used to have, Patches, and how after it died he promised never to forget them, which is followed up by such a short but impactful line. I can't remember what she looked like, Billy. Despite this heartbreaking moment, the episode still manages to end on a really sweet note, with Stan flying out to the country in which the jewelry is made, where he gets Grandpa Marsh a custom framed photo of him and Patches, so he can always remember her. My god, there she is. In season 10, South Park said goodbye to one of its most beloved characters, a staple since the pilot episode, Chef. In an episode in the prior season, Trapped in the Closet, South Park thoroughly lampooned Tom Cruise in Scientology, and Chef's voice actor Isaac Hayes was a dedicated Scientologist. Initially, while Isaac expressed disappointment in how Matt and Trey portrayed Scientology, he was on record defending South Park's style of satire, acknowledging that they tend to lampoon everybody. However, a couple of months after this statement, just a week before the premiere of South Park season 10, a statement was released 
based in Isaac Hayes' name, resigning from the show and denouncing the intolerance of the series. This led to Chef's final episode, in which Chef's performance was made up entirely of sound bites from older episodes. The episode effectively doubled down on their criticism of Scientology through Chef, as the kids tried to save him from an evil cult that made him do awful, out-of-character things. Sadly, the events of the episode led to Chef's death. But while the episode was certainly made as a frustrated response to Hayes quitting the show, the very end of the episode acts as an incredibly touching acknowledgement of all he brought to South Park. At Chef's funeral, Kyle admits they're saddened by the things Chef had done before the end of his time at South Park, but those things don't take away from all of the joy he brought them. I'm gonna remember Chef as the jolly old guy who always broke into song. I'm gonna remember Chef as the guy who gave us advice to live by. This is obviously a heartfelt moment for the characters in universe, but also for the crew and audience of South Park as they unpack the loss of a beloved character. Sadly, years later, Hayes' son would reveal that the decision to quit South Park was not Isaac's, but his entourage made up largely of Scientologists, who allegedly took advantage of Hayes after he had a stroke. A pretty sad revelation. But fittingly, the episode ends with one last jab at Scientology. We shouldn't be mad at Chef for leaving us. We should be mad at that fruity little club for scrambling his brains. One of the most impressive tricks South Park pulls off is when it gives you a plot line that is both incredibly wholesome and super funny. And that's exactly what they managed with Kip Drorty in season 14's You Have Zero Friends. When everyone becomes obsessed with gaining Facebook friends, shifting the social dynamics in South Park, Cartman tells Kyle about Kip Drorty, a third grader who sadly has no Facebook friends. Ah, oh, gee, that's... So sad. We then cut to Kip Drorty, and the vibe is sad. The slow piano music, the devastation on this kid's face as he stares at You Have Zero Friends on his Facebook page. But then, Kyle friend requests him, and Kip cannot believe his eyes. <laughs> yeah! Mom, Dad, I made a friend today! What I love about this is that it's played so earnestly. Yeah, the joke here is how superficial Facebook quote-unquote friendships are, but to Kip, this is the happiest day of his entire goddamn life. And even while laughing at the absurdity of the situation, I feel genuinely happy for this poor kid. Unfortunately, being Facebook friends with Kip completely tanks Kyle's social standing, and he ultimately decides to unfriend Kip, which is played just as earnestly. God, the way he pulls the photo of Kyle off of his wall is so sad. The rest of the episode is all about how much Stan hates Facebook, and how he's socially pressured into garnering hundreds of thousands of Facebook friends. But after a pretty fun Tron parody, Stan sends all of those friends somewhere else. For an episode titled Ike's Wee Wee, you probably wouldn't expect it to contain any sweet moments, especially given the topic is all about circumcision. But Kyle's brother Ike is about to get one since they're Jewish, with Kyle learning about this and trying to protect his little brother. This is until he finds out the shocking truth, that Ike isn't even his biological brother being adopted from Canada. It's hard to tell, I know. At this point he stops caring, wondering what's the point in helping out someone who isn't even related to him. But on the day of his bris, Ike runs into Kyle's room and shows him a photo album of all the great times they've had together, showing him that even if they're not technically related, that Kyle still loves him. She got come on different mirror. I feel like I don't see this episode get talked about nearly enough. Season 15's The Poor Kid is the only use of Kenny's alter ego Mysterion outside of the superhero focused episodes, and damn is it an inspired concept. When Kenny and his siblings are put into a foster home, his younger sister Karen has a really difficult time adjusting. But to make her feel better, Kenny uses his alter ego to show that she has someone looking out for her. I was wondering when you'd appear. You always come when I'm sad. Okay, there are so many things I love about this. One, the fact that Kenny found such an impactful way to instill confidence in his younger sister, and two, the fact that Karen says, you always come when I'm sad, implying that Kenny has always been looking out for his sister in this way. Kenny is truly one of the best and most caring characters on this show. He even protects Karen from the school bully later in the episode. He just goes far out of his way for those he cares about. But I think the most wholesome line in the entire episode is this one. But I'm all alone now. You are not alone. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, I will always be here. Helen Keller the Musical is one of the more forgotten episodes from the first couple seasons, but it's still pretty decent. What makes it better is the story Timmy goes through. 
Timmy in general is just one of the most likable characters in the whole show, and there could not be a more wholesome episode starring him. To upstage the kindergartners, the kids decide they're going to make their school play of the Miracle Worker more Thanksgiving themed, with Timmy having to go out and pick a turkey to use instead of a dog. This is followed up with him picking a turkey that isn't so smart in the head, but he loves it anyway and wants to use it calling him Gobbles. The whole episode is Timmy trying to convince everyone that Gobbles is worth using over the new better performing one they get, attempting to teach him how to do tricks. Uh, uh, uh. Ah, Gobbles! There's nothing much to say other than it's just really sweet, with Timmy even jumping in front of a bullet to see of him. It's quite a nice episode that also manages to be really funny. Tweak X Craig is one that I've talked about in a dedicated video, but there's no way this wasn't going to make the list. This is arguably the most heartfelt episode in the entire series, and it's got three top tier candidates for most wholesome moments. When the entire town of South Park latches on to the idea that Tweak and Craig are the town's first gay kids, even though they aren't, everyone lovingly embraces the idea. There's this incredible montage set to The Book of Love by Peter Gabriel where we see the town overjoyed, reminiscing and connecting in ways we haven't seen much in the series. Later in the episode, Tweak and Craig stage a breakup to get everyone off their backs, which leads to a montage set to Say Something by Great Big World, and as a result, the entire town just laments the loss of this inspiring thing that came into their lives. Both of these montages are so powerful. Eventually, Tweak and Craig decide that maybe there was something to their connection, and this is a really nice moment as well. But I think my actual favorite Tweak and Craig heartfelt moment comes in a follow-up episode called Put It Down. In this one, Tweak is freaking out hardcore about Kim Jong-un threatening the US, and while Craig tries to help help tweak the entire episode, he really is just trying to find solutions to something that doesn't really have an answer. At the end of the episode, Craig realizes that letting Tweak vent and unpack his difficult emotions is actually much more helpful. He fully just asks him what he's feeling. I bet it's terrible. What else are you feeling? What? Like I have no control over my life. Like I'm just a pawn in a big game. By allowing Tweak to work through his own feelings, he's able to figure out what he himself can do to feel more in control of his life. Reasons features one of the most iconic moments of the series, but the episode itself is all around great too, with Stan facing his first breakup with Wendy, and not knowing how he's gonna be able to go on like everything is okay. You always hear songs about a broken heart and you think it's just a figure of speech, but it's true, my chest hurts. Eventually he turns over to the Goths, wanting to wallow in his own misery and act like his life is over. However, in the B story, Butters is also experiencing his first breakup, with him being offered to join Stan and his new friends, to which he explains that he loves life, and maybe being sad sometimes isn't always a bad thing, as it can remind you of how much better the good moments are. So I have to take the bad with the good. So I guess what I'm feeling is like a beautiful sadness. This gets through to Stan, who realizes that he's never going to get over Wendy unless he tries to move on, with the episode ending on a funny note, but still manages to be heartwarming all to see him. Broadway Brodown is a hilarious episode in which Randy discovers that musicals are actually filled with blowjob-centric subliminal messaging, which Randy obviously abuses. But the subplot is actually one of the sweetest and saddest in South Park history. When Randy takes Sharon to New York, Stan and Shelley have to stay with the Feegans, a family of vegans who always wear life preservers. Cancer, heart disease, drowning, all preventable with a vegan diet and a life jacket. But when Shelley presses the family about the way they're overprotective of their son Larry, it starts to give Larry confidence he never Never knew he had. He stops by the Marsh's house and gives Shelly a flower after this. Today, I went to 7-Eleven and I ate a Slim Jim. It was the greatest thing I ever tasted. I really think this storyline is unbelievably sweet. There's a scene early in the episode where Larry is afraid to jump off the diving board, and Shelly just jumps on it until he falls in the water, which basically acts as the metaphor for the entire episode. Larry has been so sheltered his whole life, he literally is forced to wear a life preserver wherever he goes. He does not believe at all that he can swim. But Shelly gives him that push into the deep end and proves to him that he actually can. But I think the best and most wholesome moment in the episode is when he shows up for a second time, sporting a ukulele, and plays a song he wrote for Shelly. You make me come out of my shell, Shelly, you give me strength where there was only fear. 
Shelly showed this kid an entirely new way of living and helped him face his fears in ways he never thought he could. And after he plays this song for Shelly, he takes off his life preserver. It's such a great moment, and Shelly actually then invites him into play. Though admittedly, the episode does end in absolutely absurd tragedy when Randy dresses up as Spider-Man and tries to stop Shelly and Larry from seeing Wicked together, breaking open a water main and killing Larry. The poor kid drowned without his life preserver. Shelly. I'm sorry your little friend was killed by Spider-Man tonight. On one hand, it's easy to say that this ridiculous ending undercuts the sweet moments in the episode, but on the other hand, they play Shelly's reaction completely genuinely. She's devastated. And even when Randy is saying the stupidest shit, I'm still really bummed out for her. Spider-Man works in mysterious ways, Shelly. And wherever he is, he loves you. I've actually talked at length about this episode's place in South Park history in another video, but of course it was always going to make this list considering just how emotional it gets. The episode basically showcases two simultaneous crises in the Marsh family. After his 10th birthday, Stan starts realizing things he used to like look and sound like shit to him now, sending him spiraling into a cynical depression and isolating him from his friends. At the same time, Randy starts to fear that he's gotten old and life has passed him by, and that if he doesn't chase his lost dreams, he might never find happiness again. There are a few incredibly earnest and heart-wrenching moments in the episode, including this painful admission from Randy. Because I'm unhappy, okay? I've been unhappy for a long time! While South Park has obviously dipped into cliffhangers and serialization over the years, they typically will wrap up a story pretty neatly by the end of an episode. But this time, leading into a mid-season break, they actually do the opposite. Randy and Sharon don't fix their marital problems, they actually decide to get divorced. Stan doesn't start seeing the world the way he used to, everything is still shit, and his friends, they don't want to see him anymore. And in possibly my favorite two minutes in the entire show, we get this devastating montage set to Fleetwood Mac's landslide. As Stan sinks further and further into depression, his parents get divorced, and everything changes around him. I wish I could play this for you with landslide intact because it fits beyond perfectly, but you know, copyright. There are so many striking moments in this montage. Stan sitting alone at Stark's Pond as Kyle approaches but then walks away. This slider shot while Randy talks to Stan about the separation in Stan's room. Randy driving away from the Marsh house in a moving truck. Stan sitting alone on a swing. And of course, Stan lying alone in bed as they cut to the credits, leaving the audience on a cliffhanger for four full months. This show can really be sad when it wants to be. Kenny dies is about well, Kenny dying, but none the ways he previously has. Instead, here he's just sick, slowly dying in hospital, with Stan being unable to even go in and face them. The mood is just very down for a majority of the runtime, with each of the boys facing Kenny dying in their own way. Cal accepting it and wanting to be there for his friend, Carmen presumably wanting to fight it and save him, with it being one of the rare times we see the two rivals put their differences aside and hug each other over the state of their friend. But my favorite character here is Stan, who can't even process the fact that one of his friends is about to die, since he's just a kid that's not supposed to happen to kids. They do a wonderful job at making you understand his dilemma, with him almost in denial about it, wanting to act like everything is fine. But when he realizes from Chef that he has to put that aside and be there for Kenny, he rushes in happily to see his friend, where we're met with... Did he say anything before he went? He just said... Where's Stan? Gets me every time. Maybe this is recency bias, but the end of the Return of COVID special strikes me as another of one of the most heartfelt moments in the entire show. It did have the advantage of being built up over basically three separate specials. At the end of the vaccination special, we actually see the boys go their separate ways and decide not to be friends anymore. Then, in the post-COVID special, we see the sad future that takes place after the boys split up. Even far into their futures, they never maintain their friendships, and Kenny had even been trying to go back in time to reconnect them all. In Return of COVID, Cartman, Kyle, and Stan succeed in going back in time, but fail to convince their younger selves that they should be friends again. Now trapped in the past, the older trio forms a plan to basically parent trap the kids together. They blackmail Heather Williams into giving the kids a private helicopter ride and courtside seats to the Denver Nuggets game. This final montage is all set to Kelly Clarkson's I Forgive You, and I can't even describe how effective this works for the end of the episode. The kids have a blast together, and more importantly, they forgive each other. You guys, I'm sorry for acting like a dick during the pandemic. I'm sorry too, dude. There's also a bunch of great moments here where people in general set aside their differences and just apologize for being so hostile and angry, which I think is a really nice sentiment. But the kids' reconnection, that's my favorite part. So there you have it, 13 of our favorite wholesome and heartfelt South Park moments. Huge thanks to Mark for joining me on this one. And make sure to comment below what your favorite heartfelt moments in South Park are as well. All right, peace. Johnny!